Hey guys, Matt here today. Just going to do a kind of a quick video today on Hosea 1, verse 10, 11, and Hosea 2, verse 1. Uh, it's the gospel. It's the gospel in Hosea. The gospel appears several times in Hosea. The gospel appears all over the Old Testament. And it shouldn't surprise us. Jesus tells his disciples on the road to Emmaus that they're foolish and they have slow hearts and slow minds because all of the law and the prophets and the writings aka the Psalms, the writings, are about me, he says. So it's all about Christ. Hosea is a significant book. I've done several videos on it. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on Hosea 1, uh, but just a, a quick setup and what's going on in Hosea is it's a prophecy to, uh, for Israel. Israel and Judah, of course, are split up and Israel is worshiping the Baals like she does so frequently and she thinks she's okay. She thinks she's doing good because it's, it's a prosperous time, probably the most prosperous time since King Solomon. And she's got one foot in the Baals and one foot in Yahweh, which means she doesn't have any foot in Yahweh. So Hosea comes out, he is told to marry a whore. Why? Because all of Israel is a whore in Yahweh's eyes less a remnant, but most people are committing whoredom. And so he says in verse 2, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take for yourself a wife of whoredom and have children of whoredom, for the land commits great whoredom by forsaking Yahweh. So he, Hosea, went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, and she conceived and bore him a son. Verse 4, And the Lord said to him, Call his name Jezreel. Jezreel. Jezreel means God sows. Call his name Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of the house of Israel. On that day I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. Not going to get into this a lot. I've already kind of covered that, but Jezreel just means God sows. Could be bad or good, depending on what he says. He's gonna, it's going to be good eventually. He's going to turn this around, but right now this is not good. He says, name your first, first marry a whore, because the entire land to me is a whore. All of Israel is a whore. That's a remnant. And so then he has a first child, and he says, name him Jezreel, because I'm going to sow destruction on Israel. I'm going to break her bow. It's breaking your bow is... is it, the bow is Israel's strongest weapon in, in one way of saying it. And so Yahweh says, I'm going to break her bow. I'm going to put her, I'm going to end her. This is serious. He moves on in verse 6. She conceived again and bore a daughter. And the Lord said to him, call her name no mercy. For I will no more have mercy on the house of Israel to forgive them at all. Call her name mercy. No mercy. So you got Jezreel, God sowing destruction. No mercy. I'm not going to have mercy anymore. Verse 8. When he had weaned no mercy, she conceived and bore a son. And the Lord said, and here we come to the, the worst two names, call his name, not my people. For you are not my people and I am not your Yahweh. Clearly, the worst of all the names is, I am not your Yahweh. I am not your God. And this is a complete reversal of, of what God says in Exodus 3.14 to Moses. He shows up to Moses and he says, I am. Yahweh, I am. I am he who causes to exist. I am. Now he says, I am not. I am not. I'm not your Yahweh. You're not my people. It's a horrible, horrible judgment on Israel. You'll notice in here there is no call to repentance. The judgment is handed down. This is it. Uh, God divorces an entire generation of Jews here. It's a, it's a terrible passage. Now you might say, wait a minute. God never breaks his covenant, and God doesn't break his covenant. But Israel breaks her covenant repeatedly. He'd be justified in doing this after one time, but this isn't after one time. It's repeatedly, so he breaks his covenant with an entire generation. He basically gives a divorce decree to an entire generation of Israel, less a few faithful followers, a very few. So, not going to spend a lot of time on that. I've already done a video on that. 
he gets to verse 10, and suddenly in verse 10, and this is where I want to focus on, he says, Yet, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sands of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. Sounds a little bit like something we've heard before, right? Got a little bit of a hint of the Abrahamic covenant in there. And in that place where it is said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, Children of the living God. Verse 11, And the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together, and they shall appoint for themselves one head, and they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. All right, Jezreel, God was sowing destruction. Now, evidently, it's a great day. God's sowing life. Chapter 2, verse 1, Say to your brothers, you are my people. Say to your sisters, you have received mercy. So I want to focus on these three verses. The gospel is what it is. Uh, Hosea 1.10, Hosea 1.11, and Hosea 2.1. And the danger, the danger, before we even get into these verses, the danger would be, if I'm reading Hosea 1, 1 through 9, just to get to 10 and 11 and say, he didn't mean it. Some people read prophecy that way, and that's absolutely the wrong way to read prophecy. He does mean it. He does divorce an entire generation of Jews. This, what we see here, is good news. He turns it all around. In fact, he takes every bad name in verses 1 through 9, and he flips them around. Right? So the question is, when does this happen? Has it happened? Are we waiting for it to happen? Because some people would say, we're still waiting for this day to happen. We're waiting for some millennial period kingdom in the future where God's going to do this thing with Israel. Hmm. Who are the children of Israel? Verse 10. Yet the number, he's going to destroy them all, not all of them, but the large portion of them. He's going to do, divorce them. And yet the number of children shall be like the sands of the sea, which cannot be numbered. Hmm. So the question is, when's that going to happen? Who is it for? Who are the children of Israel? Is he changing his mind? So, this leads to uh, a couple thoughts on prophecy, and I, I might do more on this later, but... Uh, one thing is that we see in reading prophecy is prophecy is not meant to be read, always read literally. Prophecy is not always meant to be read literally. It's meant to be exegeted literally. In fact, I, uh, one author said it best, uh, if we're going to talk about literal translations, literally reading the Bible, the definition of literal is what did the author literally mean? So, is this to be read literal? Who are the children of Israel? And what we're going to find out today is it's not to be led, led, uh, read literal, it's to be exegeted literal. So it's not to be read literal, and prophecy is translucent, not transparent. It's translucent. We're looking through a shower door where you can kind of see it. We're looking through some stained glass or something, a window, smoky, you can see through it, you can see shapes and sizes, you can maybe even figure out human figures, but you can't see it clearly, you don't know what's going on exactly. That's how prophecy is, from this side, from this side. We're not on this side anymore. We shouldn't read prophecy or any Old Testament like we don't have our New Testament. The New Testament is our lexicon for the Old Testament. The New Testament, from this side looking back, we see this transparent. In fact, prophecy isn't written so much for the people that hear it because they can't repent. They don't have a heart to repent. They need a king who's going to come and change their heart. That's the whole buildup. The buildup is to the Christ. Prophecy isn't written for the generation that hears it as much as it's written for the generation that sees it fulfilled. In fact, if you were to look at 1 Peter Chapter 1, 1 Peter 1, 10, 11, and 12, I think it is. It says, uh, the prophets long to know what time or what person the Spirit of Christ in them. Interesting. The Spirit of Christ is speaking through Hosea. Prophets longed to know the time or the place that the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the, subs the, the sufferings 
and the subsequent glories. It, it goes on to say, they knew what they were writing was not for themselves, but for you. For you on the other side of the cross. For you who could see it all fulfilled. The prophets knew they were speaking beyond themselves. The prophets knew it wasn't for that generation because that generation couldn't heed the warning. They didn't have a heart to. So, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sands of the sea. You are not my people. They will be called children of the living God. Judah and Israel will come under one head. Who is it? When does it happen? Well, all we would need to do is go to our New Testament and find out the answer. How a New Testament author quotes the Old Testament is crucial, crucially important. So Jesus gets ready to go to the cross. John chapter 1 and uh, chapter 1 through 12, he's focusing on his deity. He's focusing on showing the world I'm the Christ, I'm healing the sick, I'm giving sight to the blind, etc., etc. He gets to chapter 13 through chapter 18 and he puts all his focus on his disciples, on his soon-to-be apostles, and he says, it's better for you that I go away because when I go away, the Counselor, the Comforter, will teach you all things. So, when we're reading through Acts or Romans or Hebrews or any book in the New Testament and we see an author quote the Old Testament, we're not relying on their memory. We're not relying on their ability to recall Scripture. We're relying on God and the Holy Spirit. And how does the Holy Spirit speak through Paul and Peter about Hosea 1? Let's take a look. Romans 9, verse 24. Romans 9, 24. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. He's speaking to a largely, mostly Gentile audience. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who are not my people, I will call my people. And her who is not beloved, I will call beloved. And in the very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. Hmm. So Peter, or Paul rather, in Romans 9, Paul quotes Hosea 1.10 and Hosea 2.23, and he ascribes it to Jews and Gentiles alike. Right? In fact, Paul says in Romans 2, verse 27, then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have written who have the written code and the circumcision but break the law. For, verse 28, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. It's a matter of the heart. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, that is, not by the law. Circumcision is a matter of the heart. It's not about being a Jew by birth. It's about being a Jew by heart. That's what Paul's saying. So Paul's making a pretty clear case here that Hosea 1.10 is about Jews and Gentiles alike. How would Peter see it? Well, let's take a look at Peter. 1 Peter, chapter 2, powerful chapter, chapter 2, the whole thing is wonderful. We'll start in verse 9, Peter speaking to a largely Gentile audience. Peter speaking says, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own choosing, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. That, by the way, that's Exodus 19, 5 and 6, spoken originally to the Jews, fulfilled in the church, Jew and Gentile alike. He goes on in verse 10 and he says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Okay. So Peter and Paul both see Hosea 1, 10, 11, Hosea 2, 1, fulfilled in the church. In the church, which is Jew and Gentile alike. How are they getting there? Let's take another look here. Let's take a look at Galatians chapter 3. 
love Galatians 3. If you ever want to see a good chapter on faith in the law, look no further than Galatians chapter 3. And in Galatians 3, you'll see a couple things. Galatians 3, 7. Know then it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. Ah, or children of Israel. You could say the same thing. It is those of faith who are sons of Israel, those of faith who are sons of Abraham. Verse 28, for, verse 26, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. To what promise? To the promise God made to Abram in chapter 12 of Genesis. And who was that promise fulfilled in? Was it fulfilled in the Jews? Hmm... He gives us the answer in Galatians 3. Galatians 3.16 Now the promises were made to Abraham and his offspring. It does not say to his offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one. And to your offspring, who is Christ. Of course. Of course, the covenant keeper. It's Christ. There's only one person the promise can be fulfilled in. The person who can keep the covenant, who can keep the law perfectly. And it's Jesus. You might even say, Jesus is the perfect Jew. You might even say, Jesus is the perfect Israelite. Isaiah might even take that a step farther. Isaiah 49, listen to me. Isaiah 49, verse 1, listen to me, O coastlands and give attention, you people, from afar. Whenever I'm reading prophecy and I hear things like coastland or all nations or afar, I know gospel's coming because it's for everybody. You'll notice suddenly it's getting bigger. Someone's speaking here. Yahweh called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named my name. Hmm. Verse 2. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. I, you start thinking, I know who that is, right? Revelation 19. Ah, this is Jesus speaking. G the Spirit of Christ, just like Peter said in 1 Peter. The authors long to know what time or what person the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating. Is Isaiah speaking in Isaiah 49? Not really. The Spirit of Christ is. And he says... Yahweh called me from my mother's womb. He gave me a name. He made my mouth like a sharp sword in the shadow of his hand. He hid me. He made me like a polished arrow in his quiver. He hid me away, verse 3. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel. Hmm. So, Jesus is the ultimate Israel. Jesus is Israel, of course. That's why in John 15, Jesus says... I am the true vine, because Israel is always referred to as a terrible vine, a bad vine, a poor vine. Jesus is the true vine. At the end of Galatians, in fact, now that we see who the children of Israel really are, at the end of Galatians, Paul says, Peace be on you and on the Israel of God. So how did Paul and Peter see us as the Israel of God and children of Israel? Because Jesus is Israel. Because we're in Christ. Paul makes a pretty big deal in Ephesians 1 about being in Christ. So if I'm in Christ, I'm holy and beloved, Ephesians 1. If I'm in Christ, I'm redeemed. If I'm in Christ, the temple, I am the temple of the living God. Right? If I'm in Christ, if I'm in Israel, then I'm an Israelite. Then I'm a child of Israel. I'm a, I am the children of Israel, I and whoever else is of faith. See, in the Old Covenant, if you wanted to come into Israel, you had to enter Israel. You had to do 
uh, all the things Israel had to do, you had to observe the law, you had to get circumcised, you had to eat what they did, you had to observe the sacrificial system, all of that, you had to enter Israel. There's only a type or shadow for the Israel, Jesus, and entering Jesus. So, back to Hosea 1, 10, yet the number of the children of Israel, who are the children of Israel? Anyone who's of faith. That's what Peter was saying. That's what Paul was saying. Isaiah backs him up by prophesying Jesus is the Israel. And see, Adam was God's son, but he was a bad son. He was a disobedient son. He gets dispersed. Israel, as we're seeing right now, was God's son. She was a bad son also. Exodus 4.22, Israel is my son. Out of Egypt I called my son. What happens in Hosea? Not my people. I'm not your Yahweh. I'm given that name, son. I'm giving it to someone else. We'll see that further on in Hosea. Jesus is God's perfect son. Jesus is my begotten son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus is the Israel of God. And so is anyone who is in him. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be like the sands of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, You are not my people, it is said to them, children of the living God. And the children of Judah and the children of Israel will be gathered together and they shall appoint for themselves one head and the one head is Christ Jesus. Now Judah and Israel here is another way of saying everybody. You'll see this reductionism in the gospel. You'll see it in Jeremiah. He'll be talking about Israel and Judah and suddenly he's only talking about Israel. You even see it in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Christ is the his in his body the wall of enmity or the wall of enmity between Jew and Gentile is broken down and suddenly there's no more Jew or Gentile there's one new man that's the gospel that's what Hosea is prophesying about that's what Peter says that's what Paul says it's all about the gospel of Jesus Christ who is Israel Jesus is Israel who are the children of Israel that are prophesied in Hosea 1:10 Anyone who's in Christ, anyone who's in the Israel of God, Jew and Gentile alike. That's how you read prophecy. Peace.